Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Command Point. I am Shane, and I am joined here today by Brett from Six Sided Legion. Brett, how's it going? Going pretty good. Happy to be here as always. Yeah, always, always a good chat. It's been a little while. Um, today, we are going to be talking about a team that you, my friend, took to LVO and did very well with. We're going to be talking about Hand of the Archon. So. Uh, for starters, uh, congrats on doing pretty well at LVO. I don't remember what your win loss was, but I know you placed pretty highly. Yeah, yeah, I took tenth. Um, I went six wins, two losses, and a draw. Yes. Okay. Really good. Really good. Um, so I guess what you've been playing into the archive pretty much since they came out, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I remember when the rules first dropped. I, I immediately thought oh this team is going to be cool um so i mean yeah pretty much playing them since the beginning uh came from the whole kazarkin thing like yeah. buff kazarkin and then went into them and i've just been stuck on them for a long time yeah i think the last time we had you on we were talking about kazarkin so that i think sounds so. right yeah yeah uh so anyway it, i guess to get into the conversation when we when ryan and i at command point did our last tier list which was like a few weeks ago uh, we had Hand of the Archon, I think, like near the top of B tier, which was a big group, to be fair. Um, and kind of like, we were both tempted, though, to kind of slot them into like bottom of A tier. So, I mean, how do you feel about like where they stand in the meta right now? Uh, I think that that area is probably pretty fair. I mean, they, they definitely... You know, like all teams, they have their... Well, maybe not all teams, but, you know, they have their poor matchups. Um, they do struggle in, in certain mission types, uh, things like that. Overall, though, I mean, they're just kind of like a different team, right? Like, they're, they're just a little bit different in the way that they play uh, compared to, like, the other... Maybe other Eldar teams and stuff. So um, I think that that's probably a pretty fair assessment, though, to put them like a high B, low A. Like, okay, cool. Yeah. Fair. To me, as in like a playstyle terms, they feel very much like a like an elf version of Legionnaires, which is a team that I love very much. And I think it's part of the reason why I've been sort of drawn to Hand of the Archon lately. Um, they're, but they're very killy. They're like deceptively tanky in their own yeah. way. Um, does that sound right to you as a comparison? It definitely does. I mean, you know, I think it depends too i i'm assuming the the reason for the tankiness is you're a big fan of the, the six up feel no pain oh yeah big fan of yeah that. yeah yeah for sure i mean when you spike in rolls like it's it's annoying to your opponent so like, yeah it is i mean i just agree the uncertainty is annoying yeah. i mean i think it's almost a certainty and somebody will comment saying oh i never make my feel no pains but i think it's usually a certainty that a guy is going to make one out of their eight wounds usually right yeah, for sure. I, I agree. So Yeah, and I think what throws the opponent off is knowing that plus knowing it could get worse than that. And then once it starts yep. to get worse than that, it's like, you know, you save one field of pain, you're a nine wound model. You save two, you're a ten wound model. Now you're like an orc with a four up save. Um okay. so it can get pretty crazy. So I guess I wanted to ask you, you did really well at LVO. Um I know whenever I go to a big tournament, I come away from it with lessons. So I guess for you, what were the biggest takeaways from from your games at LVO? Uh, let's see. Um, okay, I guess one of the things that really stood out to me, because I hadn't had this experience before playing the team, just because I don't normally play against Void Dancers specifically. Um, what I will say is the team there, they do struggle uh, into, I guess, the... Just other three APL teams, not other, because they're not three APL, but three APL teams uh, like the Clowns, which are just hyper mobile. Um, it's, I think both opponents I played were really worried about the matchup, but I was equally worried. <laughs> um, and I feel like Archon does have a lot of like tricks and stuff into them and like useful things, but at the same time, it's difficult basically just depending on the board layout and stuff um and the mission type i think the biggest thing is that loot is clearly their worst mission 
um, for reasons we'll, we'll get into, but um, basically everything else is, is a pretty decent matchup. I mean, Commandos is rough, of course, uh, as it is for everybody, um, which I had plenty of those there. Um, yeah, and you know, I guess speaking of matchups, I wanted to pivot to this. Um, in terms of the tier list that I mentioned earlier, I was looking and I noticed that every team we have above Hand of the Archon and ANS, um, they all have more activations. And in fact, they all have 11 or more activations except for uh, Felgor Ravagers, who have 10. So I guess in terms of the 11 or more, like the Horde teams, how do you think that Hand of the Archon does there? And like, how do they overcome like having that activation disparity for you? I mean, that there's definitely uh, an uphill battle, I'd say, in any of those teams. But, you know, as it's going to be, activation counts super important in this game. So, one small thing, I guess. I have, I think I've only used it maybe like once or twice in a competitive game. But they do have the, the um, what's it called? They have a tactical ploy that lets them skip an activation. Ah, uh, yes, yes. Um, and it's arrogance, yep. Yes. Um, which is kind of cool. I mean, like, I, I think there's some decent uses for it. So it, you, essentially you can make yourself 10 activations. Um, and I think there's some pretty decent uses for it. It's just like, it's very, very niche. It's like, you have to be in a very particular situation to use that effectively. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, there's that, um, I think, of course, if you're actually using the team or things are working out for you you're getting pain tokens too from horde teams which is which is a good thing there's more bodies to get pain tokens so it's like if you're using that effectively you can make yourself more apl or or just keep yourself safe after getting kills with the dash and right that's some stuff that that helps against those teams but yeah and i was gonna hurt all the time yeah and i guess on, on in terms of felgors on the other hand I talked to a Felgor player recently who told me that they they think that they hate this matchup more than any other team other than like Commandos. So do you feel like Hand does well into Felgors? I mean, I think they definitely have a decent amount of, of play. I, I mean, they can be pretty quick, right? The, the Torment Grenade gets around their war paint, so that's annoying for them. Um... Yeah, I think there's there's some decent play into them for sure. I don't know about it being like the worst matchup. I mean, either yeah. way, if they they close the <laughs> distance, you know, it's probably gonna yeah gonna be bad for you. But um, well, the hand can do one thing really well, and they can take him to Critty City, which yeah. is not a place that Felgors like to go. That um, is very true. That you can load him up with crits. That's always nice. Uh, I don't know. I haven't played the matchup myself. I'd be curious too. Um, but yeah. I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Did you play any Felgors at LVO? I did not. I was actually very okay. fortunate um, to avoid Felgor. It is definitely one of the matchups that I was a little bit more worried about. Yeah. But, you know, at the same time, I got three Commandos, which was also <laughs> a yeah. matchup I was worried about. So I was going to say, maybe so, yeah. it was the Felgor players who were lucky that they didn't have to play Hansi Yeah, yeah no. that's right. Yeah. Um, so, all right. Uh, let's talk about turn one stuff, because this has been my struggle, I guess, when trying to learn this team the most. Um so I guess for you, like, how do you like to stage for turning point one? Um, like, who are your objective grabbers? And, like, what are you threatening typically, um, like, play-wise on turn two? And, like, how do you kind of balance that? Yeah, so I like to, I, I think, and I believe it was in your guys' Discord that I was talking to some other people about this. But I am a big fan of always threatening with the Disciple with the Torment Grenade. I, I like to try to like deploy her somewhere in the center of the board, just so that way you can like kind of swing her wherever you need to and just try to activate her kind of last. Okay. Because like you always want to be hitting people with the Torment Grenade, like every turning point. And I mean, it's easy to do, right? Like it's got a huge threat range. Um, so that that's a big threat. I typically like to give like the agent uh, plasma grenade, potentially threaten that early on. Um, same thing goes actually with the the sky splinter assassin. A lot of people can get caught off guard if you set him up in like a specific spot where he's like got good line of sight on light cover. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and, and I like to, you know, if I take like infiltrate or something, so I'll keep them concealed at first, wait for somebody to move, like think they're safe and then flip him and then have him treat them as if they're engaged. That's a nice, because it's not really like an obvious threaten, but it's like you, you can catch somebody off with it. And then, I mean, he's, he's kind of a beast himself. Yeah. So, um, you know, that's a potential kill early on. Um, otherwise though, I think the common like mission grabbers, the Elixicant is kind of just a, a model. I like to, you know, do a lot of that stuff with, uh, as well as the agent, if he's not going to be getting any, you know, grenade throws, um, Sometimes the heavy gunner, simply because he just needs to kind of move up anyways. Uh, typically not really getting a shot for a starting point. Okay. Just well, the heavy gunner level. moving up sometimes. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then, you know, you, you're moving up your flare anyway, so he's probably moving towards the point. Same with the Crimson Duelist. I mean, he's just a beast for objectives anyways. So um, yeah. I'd say it's those guys pretty much pretty much okay and i guess like it, in terms of the duelist and the flare because you can kind of look at those models as like a different role than like the agent or the elixicant who are like grabbing objectives so yeah. are those melee guys are they kind of setting up for like counter charges or are like are you putting them forward in a spot where next turn they can charge something right away but they could also maybe get charged uh, like how how do you like to do that? I play pretty aggressive with them. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, and I and I would say like ninety percent of matchups maybe, um, and that is simply because of the fact that one Crimson Duelist is just so good. Yeah, uh, he's actually my favorite model in all of Kill Team at the moment. Okay, um, and uh, he's just strong. So I'm not really too concerned if somebody charges him if he's full wounds. Like he's either winning the fight or at least doing a lot of damage and uh you know so be it but then and then the flare too is just the most resilient guy on the team mm -hmm. with his reduced damage so same thing like if i'm charging somebody fantastic um and hopefully we're just getting a bunch of pain tokens with him uh which you know then you can readjust him a little bit with a dash um otherwise if somebody else charges him then that's actually probably better mm -hmm. because then realistically if he's farther back i can potentially give the pain token from getting a crit to somebody else instead of himself yeah um which is just which makes him kind of like a like a pseudo comms in a way yeah sort of yeah so um you know i position them pretty aggressively okay okay um, Six up feel no pain i think just makes it a little bit more confident too because like we were saying it's like right. you never know so if somebody <laughs> tries to move up and shoot you yeah i mean the but... the duelist is like crazy hard to kill because when you think about it if you're fighting in a melee you need to get four hits basically against it mm -hmm. minimum because you'll hit it it'll parry two and then you'll hit it again and then even after those two hits you need to hope that that's enough after the feel no pains to actually kill it and if you don't right. kill it then it's it's gonna just wipe you out so, definitely so it's definitely a uh, it's a tough model to take care of um and i think the flare is harder to kill it's hard to kill in a different way where it's i think the flare is my favorite and maybe that's just my inner nurgle legionary player talking mm -hmm. but sure. he's so so tanky um just with the minus one damage reduction uh, on normals and crits and it's to like a minimum of one mm -hmm. like i was playing the other day and somebody hit me with like a two damage weapon and i had to like remind myself that it goes down to one yeah. um, which is it's just insulting um but yeah really really good melee threats on this team um and what's nice too is like even your basic like agent with the wicked blades can be a melee threat if you have like your your offensive ploys online Mm -hmm. um just like dishing out crits um so the team can definitely flex a little bit when they need to which i i like a lot i do too yeah you can kind of play them either way like you can you can go into heavy shooting if you want to or into melee it's like you kind of get like because the equipment helps out so much right you can go either way with those mm -hmm. which is just a great thing i mean it helps you 
when you you know figure out what your matchup is in a tournament or whatever you can kind of think about okay well what do i what do i actually use this time instead of just this is kind of the standard loadout that i always take right so. um all right so i guess i have this thing that i have been dealing with whenever i'm like trying to prep for a new team um and i'm calling it the initiative dilemma where i want to stage aggressively turn one um to set up for turn two but there's always the the possibility that on turn two you lose initiative and i and in that situation sometimes your aggressive positioning on turn one that might have turned out to be this awesome thing can get, kind of get turned on your head um and like when I played at Legionaries, for instance, I would mitigate this by, you know, my forward guy would be the anointed with like a grizzly trophy. And I would be okay with losing initiative because I know nobody on the other team is going to be able to kill him. Like even a Melta is not going to kill him probably. Um, so how do you kind of approach this with Hand of the Archon? Like what's your safety net, I guess, when you're when you're playing on turn one, assuming you might lose initiative on turn two? Yeah, so, I mean, I guess one of the things is we kind of go back to the whole flayer thing again, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're positioning him aggressively, you know, he's still, you know, somebody can do something to him and maybe get lucky and take him out, but he is just really resilient, mm -hmm. hard to take off the board. Um, other than that, depending on the matchup, if it's like you're playing against like a two APL team, you know, we kind of have, with Fleet of Foot, you're kind of like a pseudo three APL team because you get that free dash after a move or vice versa. So it's like you can you can kind of use a distance a little bit okay. to your advantage uh, if if that's the case. Um, just to you know kind of keep yourself outside of most of their threat ranges and then um, be able to reach them. Uh, another thing, more that this is way less common, I would say. But I have used this on multiple occasions. Uh, the Denizens of Night strategic ploy is pretty good if you want to play back a little bit more. Uh, and that's that's the one that gives you essentially a super conceal if you're within three of your drop zone and more than six inches from whoever's currently activated, which seems like not super great because it's like three inches of your drop zone, right? But if you're playing against a you know, team just with really strong shooting, or it's like a board where, you know, there's there's a vantage point that can see to some of the light cover near your drop zone. Like that helps significantly with just keeping your guys safe. So okay. sometimes point two, that's still pretty useful. Like if you lose something but you got guys back and they just need to not be a target, like it's kind of worth it sometimes. All right, really cool. Uh, and I guess uh, on that note, like, to me, Hand of the Archon feels like a team that wants to be sort of passive on turn one and then, like, really explosive on turn two. Um, yeah. Has that been your experience? Yeah, for the most part, I'd say it is, because it's like, I, I just kind of, I like to threaten the things that we talked about. But other than that, I mean, a lot of it is just kind of getting yourself positioned and then... <laughs> turning point two is just like you said just crit city right it's Pretty like you're, you're using your <laughs> your ploys and you're just trying to get as many crits as you can basically and then uh and i'm a huge fan uh, i i love the ability of being able to use the a pain token after a kill to do a dash even after a charge oh, like yeah. that catches a lot of people off guard so it's like you can you can kill stuff and then still keep yourself relatively safe oh yeah by repositioning a little bit like it's I love that ability so much. Mm -hmm. um, and it spends all your pain tokens, right? But, like, if they aren't getting a shot back at you or something, like, that's... Yeah, because you, you can hold on to that pain token, and if the model dies, you're never going to get to use it. Exactly. So, I, I like it. Um, okay, so let's talk about the things that are kind of out of your control, uh, that being the mission you play on and the map you play on. Um, so... You kind of mentioned earlier, and uh, I kind of agree with you. It seems like loot is their worst mission. Yeah, definitely is. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I, I played a game with this team on loot the other day. Um, uh, I think it was against Hunter Clade, 
where on turn one I looted twice and on turn two I looted once and I just used all of my APL to kill things and that worked out but um, <laughs> I think you can't probably always do that but is that the general like is that been your approach if you're on loot is to just try and like go full attrition and just scoop up the points later I just, I mean, of course like with everything it, it mat matches uh, depends on like the matchup right mm -hmm. but definitely not a bad plan um but yeah i mean loot's just hard because it's like you're a two apl team with nine bodies right pseudo three apl if you're doing fleet of foot but really limits your, your team wants to be killing stuff so yeah. to have to do all these mission actions is um you know it it definitely takes away from the team's abilities um but I mean, yeah, it's I, that's one definitely one way to play it is just to kill stuff, yeah, and then and then play it later, right? But like, it's tough because you need to you need to be getting those points where you can. And if your opponent's smart, they're going to be just playing the objective really well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, I think uh, on like like the best advice I would give to people to listening, um, is like we mentioned the Cabalite agent and the um, the Elixicant are sort of just like objective grabbers if you're playing on like an open board where there's like two safe objectives and two middle objectives and two like on your other opponent's side um if i end up with first activation i'll try and grab one of the middle objectives on loot with that agent and then it's like you do that first activation and you are going three three pretty much and that's about as good as you can ask for i think on loot for the most part with with hand of the archon definitely i think that's a pretty fair assessment it's and then i mean you can kind of deny points a little bit easier right but could just mm -hmm. by positioning guys on it and whatnot and, yeah and the equipment with the banner to treat yourself as not like extra yep uh apl which is great yeah that, just that is a big one i think that yeah, that banner it's really good very strong and i think very it's good even... against elites like it's denies a lot Oh yeah, just standing there, stopping them from like capping, and I think it's yeah. even better on like secure, um, just because you can have that guy with the banner go at the end of the turn and snag a point. Sure. Um, so I guess is on that note, is there any like specific tools or like not tools, but um, plays you like to do when you're playing on secure and capture that are not quite as available to you on loot? Um, uh, let's see. So. I guess with yeah what, what i like to do and then i guess it's it's still viable on loot but uh we talked about the crimson duelist before just mm -hmm. being really good on objectives um and that that's because of his ability the brutal display um and like we said he's already just a beast in melee so i'd say most of the time you're getting into combat with him he's he's getting a kill right and he's got the potential to double kill too because he can fight again for free yep um each time you kill somebody, you can select somebody within six of him or the guy you killed, and they just can't control things or do mission actions, right? So it's good for all of them. But being able to aggressively position him or even just defensively position him on a point, right? Like if you're just killing something, and then all of a sudden you say, hey, now this guy also can't really do anything on this point. Yeah. That just kind of lets the rest of your team just be more aggressive because now you no longer have to play this defensive game. You can just move guys forward, right? Which right. is what the team wants to be doing. So, huge fan of that. And I, I'm probably biased there because, like you said, he's my favorite model. Yeah, in the game. and I get why. I mean, even on capture where there's no mission actions, the fact that you can have a guy, you can just say that guy can't control objectives. So, like, you can have the duelist move off of like a point that he controlled to kill a guy and then make the other guy not even be able to take it from you if they walk onto it like they can't even break your capture yeah so that's really sick um Definitely. and I, I guess we mentioned the uh the cabalite banner being a really good tool on secure and, and on loot i think less yeah. so on loot but but definitely on secure um and then the the other thing i want to talk to you about and i've heard a lot of hand of the archon players say that they hate into the dark so do you fall into this camp no i so i don't i think it's fine um and i actually do just really love into the dark so mm -hmm. maybe that's just kind of 
me enjoying that play style. But I don't think it's as bad as a lot of people give it, you know, they give it a lot of hate. Mm -hmm. uh, and I mean, it is a little bit more challenging, sure. Um, but I don't think it's, I don't think it's terrible. It's just a different, you have to kind of adjust the way you play the team. Mm -hmm. So it's. So, yeah. and, I, and I think like we talked about it earlier. So like they're, they want to be passive on turn one. And I think Into the Dark does support that. It makes it oh, yeah. easier to be passive on turn one. And you're never going to have to, well, not never, but you're rarely going to have to worry about getting outscored on primary on most of the Insta Dark maps, mm -hmm. um, which is really nice. So I, I know at LVO they had some of the asymmetrical layouts from um, Luster's Workshop. Did you get to yep. play on any of those? I did, yeah. Yeah, I think I played on two of them, I believe. Okay, how did you like those? Uh, I, those I actually loved, and those I think most people would agree would be just significantly easier for the team because, I mean, specifically the one that I'm thinking of was a little bit more open, I guess. Like there was there was less doors and things that I had to move through, mm -hmm. um, and it allowed me to, I think, use the team a little bit more traditionally, like you would on an open board. I've kind of noticed that about those layouts is they sometimes they feel a lot more open than the yeah. crit ops into the dark. They definitely are. Some of them are. Mm -hmm. which I'm okay with personally, but yeah, it's just a different uh, different way to approach it, I guess. Right. Right. And so, like, are you still trying to set up the Alindra on turn one on a lot of these into the dark maps? So I guess let's talk about the normal into the dark, not the asymmetrical. Um, yeah. Because I know, obviously, typically you're going to have to have somebody else open the door for him, and then he can run up and toss it. Is that Has that been, like, your line, typically? Or have you been doing that? I usually do try to do that. Like mm -hmm. I said, I'm trying to use that every turning point. Right. Uh, it, I mean, there's going to be somebody pushing towards the middle point somewhere, right? So, like, again, I just try to activate them last and have somebody else move up and get the door, and then... It's just so easy to reach people, right? So I just I want to be taking advantage of it all the time. Mm -hmm. Chip mortals in, getting the injury like it's. Uh, I think it's just too valuable. You just have to get use out of it every time. Right. Yeah, I, I, I mean, you can probably feel too. Like it's. I mean, mm -hmm. she's so safe, right? Like, just move up and chuck that thing from eight inches away if you want. Yeah, well, it's always nice, and this is like an open board thing too, but like if you activate the Yelindra last and you chuck the bomb and, you know, you poison a guy, maybe there's another operative you could have thrown it at or there was somebody else you threw it at and you failed. If you win initiative next turn, you could just throw it again right away. Um, and I've had instances where that's happened to me, and it's like, oh, my God, like that's – like a third of my team has been poisoned in two activations <laughs> back to back. Um, that could be pretty brutal. Yeah, it absolutely can. And I mean, sometimes I'm a fan too of, cause I mean, other than that, cause she's pretty much a utility piece. Mm -hmm. Like she's, I mean, that's, that's our main thing is running around and annoying everybody. Um, but I, I'm a fan of sometimes throwing like the, a wicked blade on her and making her like a little bit more of a melee threat as well depending on the matchup but um yeah that makes sense because yeah, she's, she's gonna be she's, forward right she's already up there mm -hmm. so i mean if you're and plus if you've already got like everything around you poisoned like you know stinger pistol is a weird little thing it's, yeah. it's good into some things it's, it's fun right but it's uh not always the most useful thing especially against like elites or Arthkin or anything with a, I mean, even a four up save is not really yeah. great. For have you it, ever so. killed anything with that? I have killed, I think, maybe like two things. One okay. being a Harlequin, and I don't remember what. Maybe maybe like a, like a guardsman or something. Yeah, and I'm I'm trying to pull it up right now because. So it's it's basically it's one mortal for each result under their save characteristic right and then three yep. mortals for each one yes and then if you kill something the other guys around them take mortals yeah i take a d3 mortals and then if that manages to kill something 
it happens again, which that I've never seen happen, and it sounds super fun, but I don't know how, realistically, I don't know how that's... that's I want to try that against Geller Pox. That's the spot I think I would want to do. Yeah, that. That, that could be cool, getting yeah. just like a bug with it, and then see if it explodes and get something else. Yeah, and their saves are all terrible, so... Hey. Right. Uh, Geller Pox is actually a fantastic matchup yeah. for this team, too, so it's... Pretty cool. Um, yeah. But yeah, uh... I don't even know how we started talking about this. Oh yeah, so the yeah, I know, we know. the Yalindra is a pretty decent operative to give a blade to. I would agree with that. I think I find myself giving her a blade pretty decently, like decently yeah. often. Um. So uh, I guess let's talk a little bit about turn zero, the um, the pregame stuff, because this team, they're a great one box team because I think you can really just get just about everything you need for the most part in one box. Um, mm-hmm. Which in turn means you're not you're not mixing it up too often in the team selection, uh, but there are a few little things. So um, the first one, and this is hotly debated, and I wanted to get your take on it because I see some people very anti Dark Lance, and I see some people that swear by the Dark Lance. So mm-hmm. are you are you a Dark Lance guy? I am a Dark Lance guy on open board against elites. Okay. Uh, that that's it. All right. But, that makes um, sense. <laughs> yeah, like I don't know. That's where it's most useful, right? Yeah. Like it's 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 very scary. So you just have to kind of spend pretty much the first turning point. And like we said, it's like a kind of like a passive team turning point one. So you're kind of just positioning it. Because unwieldy heavy is is a pain. Yeah. Um, but I mean you get one decent roll and I mean you're taking you're taking stuff off the board. Oh, for sure. And I mean, if you do get the kill with it, then you get a dash, or you could just stay there, and if you shoot him again, or if you activate him again, it's like he has heavy. So Right. So now you can actually dash him and then shoot without... Right. Yeah, like it's... He's not terrible. I, I think he's got his uses, specifically that one. I don't really yeah. know about into anything else. Like, I guess I did use him into Geller Pox um, oh. for a while, just to try it. But um, no, now now, and that was when I first picked up the team too, just because right. I was like, oh, big gun into big, you know, big guys, bulk. yeah, <laughs> right. But now it's like it's I don't know. I think I'd rather just take the splinter cannon okay. every time into that now. So yeah, I mean, I I've been playing a little hand of the archon lately, and I have not yet busted out the dark lands, but I'm intrigued by it. So I yeah. think I will probably just save it for the elite matchup i guess that that makes sense to me um yeah. the another pregame thing that comes up a lot uh the omen from the i believe it's the sky splinter gives out the omen yep. um i think a lot of people the standard play is to just omen your gunner that's typically what i do um whether it's the blaster or the shredder i just give that reroll ones um uh, but it does have the ability to reroll to force an enemy operative to reroll their sixes uh, but I think it seems pretty niche. Is there a, any situations, matchups you found where you actually want to do that? Definitely into Geller Pox. Okay. Um, I like to put that specifically on the Lumbergast just because it's like... So what I like to do with that is put it on him and then make sure I get my Torment Grenade into him as well. And then now he's hitting on fives and re-rolling his sixes. Ooh. So he becomes... Just, just not great. Pretty bad. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah, so I like to do that there. Um, it kind of just almost negates one of the hulks, like, entirely. Yeah. Uh, and I just do it on him just because he's, like, the hardest-hitting one. But, um, and I used to do it into Exaction before a lot of them got their buff, which which ended up giving a bunch of their guys, like, lethal five. Right. Um, because that kind of ruins it, right? Like, like, if they have lethal five, it doesn't matter anymore if they're really re-rolling sixes, if they're still getting fives, so... Okay. Um, basically, any, any team or... That has, that has like, a model that I think is hitting on fours, I think is, is like... And doesn't have the lethal rule, right? Like, I right. think that's kind of, like, a viable option, just because of the fact that if you are taking away they're already hitting 50 50 right and then if you're making it so they have to re-roll crits yeah 
again, if you're getting a torment grenade into them, now they're only hitting thirty three percent of their chance of their their rolls, and then they got to re-roll stuff. Like, I think it's useful into any of that. Yeah, no, I can definitely see that. It's it's pretty interesting. Um, okay, very cool. But otherwise, if you're giving yourself the omen, you always give it to the gunner, right? For sure. Yeah, always to the gunner. It's it's just too it's too good on the gunner, especially if you're taking like a shredder. Yep. Um, I mean, or on the blaster, right? Oh, yeah. like, either way, it just makes him such a such a scary threat. Uh, and I wanted to talk about the equipment because I really like Hand of the Archon's choices of equipment. There's not a lot that's like mind blowing, but almost everything feels useful. Um, yeah. I guess looking at the list, I've never taken a chain snare. I'll be honest. <laughs> Neither have, have I. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Didn't think so. I didn't think I was missing anything there. Yeah. Um, the Wicked Blades we've talked about. I love throwing them on like an agent and an elixicant, maybe like the um, the Yelindra like we talked about. Uh, yep. So are there situations where you're taking more than just a couple? Like are there any matchups where you just want to spam melee? Um, I guess I would take them into – or I'd take more of them, I guess, into like a – just like a squishier team as well. Like uh, maybe like vet guard or or anything where I'm just like maybe pathfinders too, right? Where I'm trying to just get close, get into the melee, basically. Yeah. Um, I'll try to take a lot of them for that. Yeah, uh, I like that. And like the gunner and stuff too, just because that gives him the option to reroll ones with the omen and four attacks now, and that's quite quite good as well. Yeah, I like that, especially the shout for like vet guard, because my experience playing crew, for instance, is that three attacks, three four doesn't reliably kill like guardsmen even yeah so having the 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 four attacks i think especially with in death or in death uh the the auto crit ploy i forget what it's called um from and, darkness death from darkness death and with the the rending ploy as well you can actually start chunking away those those guardsmen pretty easily with the three four melee um definitely so I find that I always have four equipment points just reserved for giving the flare and the assassin, um, or the du- the flare and the duelist, uh, lethal five melee. Mm. It, do you do this as well? I actually so I always always on the flare right just okay. to make him more reliable, but I actually never do it on the duelist. Oh okay. Never. Um, I just don't care about crits on him really, to be honest. Like I, I, he's just already like so good i feel like crits are just extra all right i i i, I, don't, I mean i've enjoyed it for the parry up, crit you know. the double parry sure, yeah crit that's fair nice. that's fair yeah um but all right pretty interesting i'll have to try that um just saves a couple ep right like yeah use it somewhere else instead i mean he's already a beast like true but i mean yeah i guess if you're you know if you're playing into stuff that gets a lot of crits that's definitely uh an option too it's just with from darkness death too you're the one doing the charge too like mm-hmm. you're you're getting one right he's hitting on twos so oh, yeah. pretty reliable so um i guess with the uh refined poison i've seen a lot of debate on the refined poison um i've the only place i've ever taken it on is like the splinter cannon I don't know if this is actually good because it has lethal five and with from darkness death, you're going to be getting a bunch of crits anyway. Um, do you take refined poison? I take it occasionally if I'm mm-hmm. trying to go really heavy on the shooting side of things, but even so you can really only take a couple. Yeah. So I'll end up putting it on like agent or the elixicant. Um, I do like putting it though on the splinter cannon on into the dark specifically um, because uh, the fact that uh, on Into the Dark, I like to use him as just like a, a guard operative. You can just right. move, dash him, guard, and then he's still a very scary thing on guard. Yeah. No, and then having sure. four or five damage is just, it's good against most things. So. That's fair. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of funny how, like, the. You could kind of. I've never done this, and I don't think it's. It's probably not good. But the the idea that you could like create like a pseudo ninth specialist by just giving all of this equipment to just the agent, <laughs> and yeah. you give him four attacks, right. you give him lethal five, you give him a, a lethal five bolter, um, you give him a plasma grenade, throw a cab light banner on him, 
<laughs> and you've just got secret agent and Cabalite out there just doing it all. Yeah, you, you could. I mean, dude, you could even <laughs> throw the Phantasm Grenade Launcher on them. Why not? Why not? Have you ever used the Phantasm Grenade I, Launcher? I have. Um, I actually really like it against... This might be the only... Are you going to say no, Gellerpox? I guess probably, probably Cult and Gellerpox. Okay. Um, I put it on the Flayer. Because okay. Turning Point 1, he's not probably getting into combat anyway so i like to just move dash and then try to get guys because it's like you're not he's not probably doing anything else so you might as well and it has a huge radius yeah it's th i just realized it's three inches from this from yeah. from like the point where you put it which is six inches from the operative and you can do yeah. it concealed yeah oh wow so, so it's actually like in it, it you might as well like it's on a four so it's not great and then it's on a five if you can't see them but it's like, dude, you're yeah. probably hitting a few things. And that's part of how I actually try to counter cult um, is with the turning point one, just try to stun a bunch of stuff with it. The torment grenade trying to hit things, uh, being aggressive with the plasma grenade. So th those are the three things that I that I really try to do. And I guess the same goes for, for Gellerpox too. You can do the same. Yeah. Gellerpox so. hates stun, I think, more than any team. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm seeing a common thread here that this team has a lot of tools in a Gellerpox. <laughs> mm, yeah. I guess yeah, if you have yeah. any local Gellerpox players, you can bust this out against them. Um, and while we're at it, yeah. let me just go over one more thing for Gellerpox, too. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> the Elixicant. Uh, the Hulk stun. hate the Elixicant. Oh, yeah. yeah. Dude, you just keep the Elixicant, like, near one Hulk. So <laughs> what I do... I omen the one, right, the lumber gas, and I torment grenade it. And then I'll get the elixicant close to another one and just repeatedly stun it. <laughs> and then, even if they charge you, you can fall back for one less and yeah. stun it again. And it's oh, just, wow. you keep two hulks basically out of the game, essentially, and it's just super frustrating taking out those big guys, like making them just basically useless. Wow. Feels good, though. Feels really good. I like it a lot. Um, so obviously the plasma grenade comes out a lot of the time. Yep. Um, maybe not against elites, but even there, maybe. Um, the Cabalite banner we talked about already. So I wanted to talk a little bit briefly before we wrap up about a couple of... Um, uh, there was one ploy I wanted to talk about in particular that I really like, but I think it's pretty niche. Um, and that is... Uh, devious scheme the basically the tax mm. so when your opponent uses a ploy you use devious scheme and then the next time they use that ploy they have to pay an extra for it um for me this is like i look at this and i think just a scratch from commandos oh yeah um and i don't know any other i haven't thought deep enough to to like consider other teams to use this on but um definitely just a scratch that just seems like a no-brainer um, yep. What other ploys do you think fall into this? So I have a whole list okay. for every team. Um, I made this a long time ago. Maybe not a long time ago, but um, when I got really big into the team. Because I wanted to make sure that I was getting use out of that. Uh, and just kind of making it much more difficult for my opponent, depending on what they're playing. Great. So I have something for each team. And I think basically wow. what it just comes down to is taking whatever either annoys you the most or is just obviously strong. Um, like, for example, Vet Guard in Death Atonement, right? Yeah. Um, that it's just, it's so good. It can shut down your plays. Like, you want to make sure that they're really considering, like, oh, do I spend two CP now to try to do this? Or. And, and it can catch people off guard a lot if they're low on CP. Like you said, with Justice Scratch, that's that's a huge thing. Um, you know, that's... It's like, do I really want to spend two CP to try and ignore yeah. this die? Like, it's... It's okay. it's pretty strong for that stuff. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've got options for every team here. Okay. So, I mean, there's, <laughs> there's a lot. Uh, I've Let me guess one. Uh, maybe Vanguard for Phobos? Yep, absolutely. Okay. So I'm, I'm just trying to think of what is something that a team will use every turn if they can. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, pretty interesting. I'm. I'll have to do a little more deep diving on Devious Scheme, but um, 
all I think about is just a scratch whenever I look at it. Yeah, no, that's totally fair. I think that's probably one of the, the best uh, uses. You can also just put it on CPU reroll. Wait, can you? So, yep, because you can use it on uh, any tactical ploy. Wow. Or any strategic or tactical ploy. And since CPU reroll counts as a tactical ploy. If you uh, if you ever devious scheme my tactical reroll, I that's just me... I will not use tactical reroll again. That's simply all yeah. that, that, that says. Right, because um, it's like if there's a team where you're not super, like, set on, oh, I need to tax this. But if they, like, blooded. Big for blooded, right? Because they're not really spending CP true. on strategic ploys. It's a lot of CP rerolls. Okay. Just tax it. Really cool. And that um, was actually something I didn't figure that out until... Like like recently, I like I was playing with Lightning from Six Sided Legion, and we were like, "Wait a minute, you just tax CP reroll for some of these teams." Yeah, and it's like, "Wow, that actually sucked." <laughs> yeah, that's pretty cool. And I mean, it, normally you look at Devious Scheme, and it's like, "Oh, well, you're dropping a CP for it." But you know, if you're if you're passing, if you're like using that leader pass uh, effectively, and you're not just like, you know, robbing yourself for the sake of a CP. Then, like, you're not really falling behind on tempo at all. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, there are some teams, I guess I just wanted to shout out, like, um, Hunter Clade, uh, Vet Guard. Well, maybe not Vet Guard. Um, Hunter Clade, Vet Guard, sometimes. Uh, what's the other one? There's another one. Um, Hearthkin Salvagers. Teams that have these things that they do in the strategic phase that they're just not. They Most of the players will not pass on doing it like if you yeah. go first on turn one and you pass to get a ploy against vet guard and then they pass they're not getting their order they're not doing into the breach i yep. i think that's just worth it um against hunter clade you can pass and they literally can't pass they have to pick a doctrina so that's like a no-brainer and then every turn after that if you go first you can pass and then all right, they can pass at that point, but then they're getting the deprecation on the other Doctrina, and they probably don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so there's some teams you can really, like, bone by doing that. Um, so I think sometimes yeah. people get too, like, into it. Like, they, they overthink it a little bit, too. Yeah. Because it's like, listen, if, I'm, if I pass, and then you think that this was, like, I'm just trying to get my extra CP so you're going to pass and skip your ploys just so I can't use any ploys, like... Mm -hmm. I benefited from this at least in some way. <laughs> like, oh, right. it doesn't really matter that much. So, like, if it's gonna happen, and against some hordes, whatever. like, all right, they might pass, but like, like Vetguard, do you really need from Darkness Death and Blade Artist to kill Vetguard? Exactly. Not really. Um, so I like. There's bonus, right? So it's yeah. But getting getting that extra CP, it also makes it so I am much more willing to like do a cp reroll somewhere in that turning point too because i'm like well i can get cp i can get two cp if my leader is still alive like i'm not too stressed about it yeah so awesome well i, I think we're gonna wrap this up now uh did you have any final tips you want to throw out before we get close out um i guess i would say oh actually yeah the the one because people ask this all the time. They go, oh, six up, feel no pain, or extra inch of movement, what do you do? Um, and, and I say, every time is the six up, feel no pain, except the one time I don't take it is against cult. Uh, and that is simply because of the fact that I want to be super aggressive early game. And I want to try to get shots that I normally couldn't get. Okay. And then I also want to be able to run away. <laughs> yes, so. that's fair. Okay, really cool, really cool. I never would have thought of that. Um, interesting. Well, anyway, uh, Brett, so we're closing out here. Before I do my outro, do you want to do any shout-outs? I know you're you're doing Six-Sided Legion with uh, with Blaine and a few of the other guys over there. Do you want to shout them out? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so we um, we are growing our channel. Uh, we are approaching 1,000 subscribers here. we nice. just been working on getting battle reports out we have other stuff uh planned that just needs to you know we're just working on actually getting it recorded um we have been kind of thinking about the idea of doing a podcast so uh, a lot of a lot of developments there so definitely check us out on youtube 
Uh, I would also just like to shout out uh, my good buddy, Dakota Luster. He has helped us out significantly over our time since we started doing this. He's He's been a very good friend. He's a great TO. If you don't know him, he's a West Coast TO. Uh, he's Luster's Workshop uh, is his company. He does a lot of great stuff. You, you can see some of the things that he makes on our channel, including his terrain, um, tokens, things like that. Always been a great guy. He's got his own podcast as well and YouTube channel. Um, just a great guy. So I think he deserves a shout out out of anybody. And, yeah, Dakota uh, Rocks. Shout out to Dakota. Yeah. And Squad great Games. Guy. That's his podcast. Go check that out. Um, all right. Well, that's that's awesome. This has been a really good chat. I'm excited to uh, to hear your comments. So if you're enjoying this, then go down to the comment section. Share your uh, your Hand of the Archon wisdom uh, if you have any out there. And, uh, you know, let us know how, how you enjoyed the content. Shout out to everybody who is subscribed. If you're watching and not subscribed and you enjoy the content, subscribe. We are, we're getting closer to 9,000, which I feel like we've been in the 8,000 range for... It feels like it's been years. It can't possibly have been years, but it feels like it's been years. Um, and uh, extra shout out to everybody over at patreon.com slash command point supporting us. Uh, we have our $1 tier, our $4 tier, and our $6 tier. Um, and over at the $6 tier, I am uh, uploading my games that I record from my uh, Command Point Tournament Series um, TTS tournament games. So if you want to go check those out, that's uh, right down in the description at patreon.com slash command point. And once again, thank you, Brett, for joining us here today at Command Point, And thank you to everybody watching. And uh, have a great rest of the day.